Welcome everyone. We're here today with Darren Jacklin. He is a personal coach, corporate trainer, investor, and we're here today talking to him about what he sees as kind of the potential for education, what things could be done differently in his experience, and just overall how we can help the kids kind of achieve their best through the school system or maybe not through the system, whatever, whatever we think is going to work. So, thank you Darren. Thanks for allowing me to be here today. Thank you very much for coming. And why don't we start off with a quick overview of your schooling experience. Sure. Where did you go to school and how was your schooling experience? So I grew up in a small community in Swift Current, Saskatchewan, Canada. Less than 20,000 people in population, a lot of farming community as well. I grew up in a middle income family, mother and father, older brother, younger sister. And for me it was, you know, I went to public school. I failed grade one. I had a learning disability, was not good at uh, academics or school. Had a problem uh, sitting still in school. I was very hyperactive, very engaging. I was a kid who liked to learn by experiential. So I learned best through games and activities. And I was also a kid who was, you know, had a lot of imagination and creativity. So for me was being a visual learner, I learned visually. So I didn't learn traditionally in the school system where I was taught auditory learning where you sit and you conform and you just listen to a bunch of regurgitating information. I learned best by you know, give me an exercise, give me an activity, let's break into small groups, let's interact, give us a problem or a challenge to solve. And so school was very hard for me. I used to get in trouble all the time in school for daydreaming. In fact, I call it dream building today as an adult. And then going through school was a real challenge. You know, I was socially awkward. Uh, when I was one years of age, I actually had a sister that died of a heart transplant failure. Uh, she was four years of age. I had an older brother at six years of age. That was very hard on the family. And so as I went through school, it, you know, it was different meeting friends, hanging out with people. And so at age seven, I created my first little company called Rent a Kid in Swift Current, Saskatchewan, Canada. And I would go out and cut grass, shovel oh, sidewalks okay. in the wintertime, and deliver newspapers six days a week to regenerate your post. And so how, I became. How old were you when you started that? Seven years old. Okay. Rent a Kid, yeah. So I was very entrepreneurial at a very young age, but I didn't come from an entrepreneurial family. I come from a government family who said, you know, go out, get good grades, go to school, and get a good, good safe, secure government job. Right. Okay, um, so I'm just curious on my own now, so when did that kind of start to shift for you? Like you said it, it was just kind of always in you, but did you have any influences or was that just kind of your nature to do it? That kind you know, of I think the thing was is that I had low self-esteem as a kid, was very insecure, and I think for me was in terms of a human need, it gave me a sense of uh, attention. When I would go knock on doors, and I cold called a lot of doors back in those days, uh, you know, I was I was I was scared as a kid, but also excited because I knew if I, I knocked on enough doors and cut enough, enough grass for people's lawns or shoved enough sidewalks in their time, I could make enough money to buy my own bicycle or I could get my own lemonade stand. And so that excited me because I started to get the attention in my neighborhood where I lived. And so it became like a drug to me. It was a drug of of, of making a difference. And I and I learned early on that if I solve a problem in my neighborhood, I get paid for it. And it's a fair means of exchange. And I thought if I had money, then I'd go out and buy things that I wanted as a kid. Beautiful. Okay, so why don't we start then um, with what you see as kind of the purpose of education. If sure. we're going to kind of get into the actual education system. So what do you think is the purpose of education? Sure. Well, I've had a chance now to be on four continents in over 40 plus countries around the world. I've had a chance to personally work with and coach and mentor and guest speak at, uh, you know, work with some of the most affluent, wealthiest or rich kids in the world to some of the most impoverished uh, you know, kids in the slums, to kids in rural areas like in Africa. So I've had a very big laboratory, if you call it, over the last 20 years of working with you know, hundreds of thousands of people. I think the purpose of education is to you know, give people an understanding of intellectually, their left side of their brain, to learn how to memorize, to study, you know, time management, you know, you know, to be able to conform to certain systems, and, and it teaches you some great skills. You know, I don't knock public or private education. It teaches some great life skills, but there's benefits and there's drawbacks to everything. And so I see, you know, the benefits of education and I also see the drawbacks of education. And I see a lot of the gaps or the holes that have not been filled over the last several years, especially today with the high speed of internet technology. You know, the education system is getting left behind. You know, I, I have a good friend of mine that works at Google in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. And he told me recently on a, on a Skype conversation that 98% of the knowledge today that's available out there that you can get at the public library on the internet yeah. is indexed today on Google. 98%. Look, look at an iPhone today, Siri. 
You just ask Siri a question in a matter of seconds, she gets you information. It's not always 100% accurate, right. but she gets you information globally in a matter of seconds. So the game has changed. And so today is that, you know, people today are drowning in knowledge, but they're starving for wisdom. That's right. Yeah, I agree. How do you think we can help change that a little sure. bit? Because I know that a lot of, like, I think that's one of the main things is that we get a lot of intellectual knowledge in school. Absolutely. But then when we get out of school, we kind of don't know how to use it and or what to do with it. Maybe. Sure. I have friends of mine that are school teachers. I have friends of mine that uh, work in college universities throughout the world. I have friends of mine that are you know, on contract with various different uh, universities and colleges for night classes, courses, stuff like that. So I'm in frequent communication with a lot of these professionals from around the world with various different academics and, and educational backgrounds from all different ages. One of the things we can improve it on is number one is financial education. You know, Robert Kiyosaki wrote a great book many years ago. It was a New York Times bestselling book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Right. You know, phenomenal book that taught you, you know, what the poor and the middle class do not know. You know what I mean? And, and it's a book that teaches you life skills about financial education. You know, today, you know, entrepreneurship in a school. You know, we're taught to go out and get a job in the industrial age to go work 40 hours a week. Well, that, that game's over. You know, that's not a dream today. That's a pipe dream. Because the thing is today is companies that are laying off people at a massive rate. We're seeing all kinds of globalization of outsourcing. We're seeing millions of baby boomers who are going to retire between now and the year 2020. And so the world has changed. So entrepreneurship creates jobs. You know, whenever there's an election in the United States or in different countries, you always say how oh, the government creates jobs. Governments don't create jobs. It's the entrepreneurship of entrepreneurs that creates jobs. Right, yeah. So I think that children should own two bikes, one to ride and one to rent. You know, teach a child how to save 10 cents out of every dollar. So financial education is very important. Personality styles. Teach the teachers, the educators, the professors today how to understand people's personality styles. Are they an introvert? Are they an extrovert? Are they detail oriented? Are they big picture? Are they touchy feely? Or are they more logical and methodical? You know, and there's there's many different Myers Briggs, true colors, personality profile, discs, just Google. There's all kinds of them on there, right? And so the thing is teaching educators that kind of stuff. Also, is understand people's learning styles, whether they're an auditory, a visual, or a kinesthetic learner. Do they learn by hearing things, by visually seeing things, or tactile, kinesthetically doing things, or a combination of all three? You know, a few years ago, I had a chance to work with a phenomenal organization out of the United States, out of California, called supercamp.com. And if any of the parents are watching this, if you want to provide the best education for your kid, go to supercamp.com. I'm a raving fan. I had a chance to work on faculty as a team leader with their organization for three years uh, in California and also in the country of Singapore. But I, it was a phenomenal organization. So what are, what are they doing specifically? Experiential learning. They okay. teach you hands-on experiential learning in an accelerated learning environment. And I saw kids from all walks of life from over 30 plus countries around the world come into that environment from ages 13 to 18 years of age. And in 10 days at a super camp program, transformation of their life in terms of results. So can, can, is it okay if you give us an example of something they teach at the, sure. at the camp? They'll teach you, uh, they teach you about how to, how to study for exams. You learn about, uh, you know, you do a ropes course on day five, but you learn how to deal with other kids at your level, but how to interact with other people. They learn you, they learn you how to get better academic grade point average in terms of scores at school, okay. in the school setting, but also they teach you life skills. It's kind of hard to explain, but through a whole bunch of games and activities over the course of a 10-day camp, the youth forum, you learn in a very high-level accelerated learning program how to, how, it, it, like, I still to this day, you know, and that was, you know, 15 years ago, I was at super camp, you know, 15 years ago, and I still to this day use super camp training in my own life, to this day, and I was, I was on staff, not okay. a student, but I was a student of learning. Gotcha. All right. Well, I like that idea. Um, so you mentioned before a little bit about Robert Kiyosaki. Sure. That was a man that influenced me a lot. And I want to go get into what kind of training or books we should be reading. Absolutely. And, and at what age do you think that sure. kids can start learning? Because sometimes I talk to parents and they think, oh, like for teachers even, that kids kind of can't learn it. Yeah. But then I talk to some people and they think, like, I, I'm teaching my kid, like, he's like eight years old, I want him to learn. So what are your what are your kind of tips or tricks or or just thoughts on what books we should be reading and what we can teach the kids sure. at an earlier age? Well, I, I was labeled with a learning disability at a very young age, growing up as a kid, and today I believe that kids do not have a learning disability; it's a teaching disability. 
I think that any kid can learn given the right proper environment tools. Listen, I was just in Africa recently in uh, Uganda, East Africa, and I was out in the rural areas of Uganda where there's a little straw grass hut. There's no running water, there's no electricity, there's no toilets, there's nothing. There's a dirt floor with a little grass hut eating crickets and grasshoppers and whatever you can eat, you know, whatever you can eat around the world in, in that environment, I mean. And I saw children learn at a very young age that were little sponges to learning. So one of the things is in terms of reading books, I'm an avid reader. I read about seven books a month cover to cover. So what I learned years ago from one of my mentors, he said to me, he said, Darren, commit to reading 10 pages a day of a good book that can elevate your life personally professionally. 10 pages a day times 365 days in a calendar year is 3,650 pages if you do the math. 3,650 pages is equivalent to 12 to 15 books cover to cover in one calendar year. So if you looked at a New York Times best-selling book, it's between two to 300 pages cover to cover that book. So just by reading 10 pages a day, right? Easy to do, easy not to do. There's the difference between the masses and the people who succeeded best in class. The masses will make up excuses and stories, oh, I'm too busy, I don't have time to read 10 pages a day. The kid who's best in class or the adult who's best in class, they read 10 pages a day. And what I've done, the other thing what I do in terms of reading is I dedicate one hour of focus, concentration, everything. So this year for me is about raising capital. I want to raise $5 million this year for a finance company I've co-founded recently called Global Access Capital Corp. And what I'm doing now is I'm studying one hour a day on raising capital. So I go to YouTube.com. I go on the internet. I download books to my Kindle. I interview people. I talk on the phone. I go for a, a breakfast with somebody as mentorship or coaching or an advisor role to me. So I spend one hour a day for the whole year that's 365 hours in a year. Now, if we take a college university semester of education, that's about 500 hours is a, is a college semester of education in one year. Right. So if I just read 300, if I just do 365 hours, but here's the difference. See, every day I don't do an hour. I do about an hour and 10 minutes, an hour and 15 minutes. Some days if I'm traveling on an airplane, I'll do even more, 90 minutes, two, three hours. Well, no big deal today if I do two, three hours and I'm sitting on an airplane. Right? But you compound that over a calendar year of 365 days in a year, and I'll actually exceed 500 hours in the year, which I've learned through self study equivalent to a college university special education. The other thing is get a mentor, get a coach, join a mastermind group, get around people who are best in class at what they do, who are centers of influence, who can level you up to the next level. You know, I, I always want to be the dumbest kid in any, or dumbest man, or any dumbest guy in any group. Why? Because if I'm the dumbest guy in that group, I grow the, grow the most. I, mean, I build companies today, and I'm not the smartest kid in the group. What I do is I go ahead and I find people who are smarter than me who have a certain skill set, kind of like professional hockey. I know my position. I play, if I'm a goalie, I play goalie position. If I'm center, I play defense. I don't play defense. I don't play forward. I'm not head coach. I'm not assistant coach. I'm not the personal trainer. Okay. I, I play my position. So the best thing in life, whether you're 10 years old, or you're 30, or 50, or 80 years of age, play your position. I just met with a woman last weekend. I had dinner in Vancouver, Canada with a woman who's 90 years of age. She was Mother Teresa's best friend for 40 plus years. She was like Mother Teresa's business partner. She's this lady's 90 years of age. She travels full time around the world. She works five days a week, 10 to 12 hours a day. She personally sponsors 25,000 children in the slums of India every day for meals. She also sponsors 32,000 children a day in the slums of India for their education. That's amazing. She's 90 years old. She's not in the senior's home. She's not sitting at home complaining about life. She's 90 years old. I sat there in a three-hour dinner with her, and I asked her, tell me the next 10 years from 90 to 100. And she laid out the master plan for me, and I had goosebumps on goosebumps. I thought, man, I'm 42 years of age. I'm not playing a big enough game. She's twice my age. And she's still kicking butt at 90 years of age. And so it really shifted my perspective of the human potential of self-actualization of what we can do in the world. We just need a different reference. We need a different mentor, a different coach. And so if you want to learn to read, like I struggled with reading in school, I get around different kids. I get around different people. And when you get around different people, it changes your environment because proximity is power. So what I'm, like, I, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. But the kids in the school system... They're kind of forced into a group. For sure. Right? They have their certain peers. They have their teachers. And they may be at a high level, but most of the time I would say they're at kind of mm -hmm. average level. Average level, yeah. So what can that kid do? Or, or how, like, if we're going to do something for the kids, what do you think 
we could do specifically? Like, can we bring in some mentors to the schools? Sure. Maybe, I don't know, put them in groups doing certain things. Do you have any ideas on Absolutely. that? Well, I've had a chance to work with a lot of kids. And one of the things I always encourage kids is that, you know, kids learn best by role modeling, right? That's why they follow Hollywood so much, right? And they want to, in school with fashion, with posting, why they're always following certain trends, whether Britney Spears or Justin Bieber, whoever it is, right? right? So the key thing is, is modeling is very important. So you go to the leadership kids in schools and you empower them through leadership programs or through workshops or seminars or outward bound programs, kind of doing Boy Scouts and Girl Guys, stuff like that. And what you do is, through those kids who are best in class or centers of influence, they empower other kids, right? So you leverage yourself through that way. Another thing is, with kids, is they have access to the internet today, right? And so I was, I was with some friends of mine the other day and they're in business and they're in Rotary International and the Chamber of Commerce and she's in women in business. And I said to her, I said, you know, you've got three children. When was the last time you took your three kids or one of your three kids to a business meeting? You know, take them into a meeting when you're negotiating a deal or a contract. Show them how you talk to a financial planner or financial advisor. Show them a call that you're on with your attorney or your accountant or your bookkeeper or your tax planner. So involve them in all those kinds of things. My nieces and my nephews, I'm always around them. And with permission, I put people on speakerphone or they hear me, but they're always watching and observing me because I always say, never assume you're not being observed. We're always being watched, right? And so involve them in that environment. So with kids today, they need positive role models. So here's the challenge is you've got people today, and, and bless them, they're great people, they're educated people, but you've got people today that are teaching people today stuff that they don't live it. See, when I train people, when I travel the world and do seminars and workshops and see conferences, when I train in terms of content and deliverables, I live. I've got results. I have a degree in results in that area. I won't get up and speak in front of a large audience of people or small audience of people unless I've got the results to prove what I've done. Right. right? Because talk is cheap. Right? And so the thing is today is with kids today, play games, activities, create opportunities, create field trips for them. Now I understand there's liability factors with kids leaving the schools. But teach kids at seven, eight, nine years old, okay, here's a project this semester. We're going to create a lemonade stand. You know, we're going to go out and sell magazines. We're going to go out and see how we can do, you know, crowdfunding. You know, and we're going to do all these different things with stuff. And see, kids, they do not lack capacity. They lack teachers. They, they can, kids can learn multiple languages today if you put them in an environment to learn the languages. I met a kid here recently who speaks 13 languages, reads and writes 13 languages, and he's 11 years of age. 13 languages. Yeah, he was born and raised in Europe, right? So automatically he learns five or six languages in his household. But this kid's father put him into an environment so he's learned 13 languages. And he's 11 years old and he can read and write 13 languages. That's normal. So that kid can be a huge modeling influence to other kids who want to learn how to read and write other languages. That's great. You know, I think you brought up a really good point, and that's that if we put kids in like a, a high achieving environment, sure. they're way more likely to do it, right? And they're way more likely to step up their game. Because I think um, something that, I don't know if we forget or what, but that our environment has a huge impact on us, right? If we're, if we're surrounded by, you know, I don't know, thugs or whatever, like we're tending to become like a thug. Or if you're surrounded by rich people, you're tending to become rich. Absolutely. So I think we need to be very uh, conscious of that. Well, they've done studies and they've done research over the last several years uh, throughout North America on this continent that your life will be about the same five years from today except for two things. The books that you read and the people that you spend time with in proximity, right? So for most people, they, they grew up in an environment and that's their friends. They may have social media friends, they may have church friends, they may have school friends, they have people in their community. And the key thing is, is not realize that those five people, you know, you're, people are some total in terms of financial net worth of the five people they spend the most amount of time with in proximity, right? So if, if you want to earn more money or get a promotion or increase your wage, your salary, your job, or your career, or your business, you've got to choose who you're hanging out with, right? right. Because, because, because proximity is power. And most people are unconscious and not aware of that because they just model it from their parents and their environment, right? right? I always tell people, I said, take some time every month, sit back. And take inventory of who you're spending time with. And then actually, like, you know, Jim Rohn was a gentleman who uh, was an influence in my life in my early 20s. He's passed away now. But Jim and I sat one day, one-on-one, -on -one, Jim Rohn. And he said three questions to me that I remember to this day. Who am I around? What have they got me becoming? And is that okay? So step number one is who am I around? Just take inventory. Look around. Who are you around? What do they have me becoming? 
as a person, personally and professionally. And step number three is, is that okay? Who am I around? When that becomes okay. And when Jim Rohn shared that with me, that a light bulb went in my head thinking, wow, I'm going to become more aware of this because I got to look at who I'm spending time with. Right, if you're around negative people, you're going to become a negative person. Yeah. Right? It's a law of influence. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I think that would be a pretty interesting test if, uh, if we had kids ask that question in like grade five, grade six, and see what they would come up with because I think things would change Absolutely. pretty quick. Okay. So, um, one of the questions I have is, if you could design a high school, what subjects would you include in that school? Great question. So one of the things that I do, I love to give back and go into high schools, public and private around the world, from grades nine to grade 12 or grade eight to grade 12. And one of the questions I always ask the audience is, how many in this room plan to graduate from high school, grade 12, and then go off to college, university? And I'll ask the audience, and a number of hands will go up. And then I'll ask, I say, great, how many in this room with a show of hands, after you finish college or university, plan to come out of school with student loan debt? Raise your hands. And one of the hands will go. And I'll say, why? And I'll just look around. And sometimes I go silent for at least 90 seconds. I don't say anything. And people start to get awkward and uncomfortable. It's like, really, this is weird, right? And I said, hey, this. I said, here's something to understand. The quality of your life is determined by the quality of the questions you ask yourself on a consistent basis. The quality of your life is determined by the quality of the questions you ask yourself on a consistent basis. If we go to Google and type in why am I stupid, why am I stupid and hit search, up will come reasons of why you're stupid. Just try it. If you go to Google and type in why am I a genius and hit search, up will come up on Google why you're a genius. I did it on my iPhone the other day with Siri. I asked why am I stupid, Siri, and Siri took me to the internet and she showed me why I'm stupid. And I said, Siri, tell me why I'm a genius. And she went to the internet and she showed me why I'm a genius. So the quality of our lives is determined by the quality of questions we ask ourselves on a consistent basis, right. right? So we want a better life, start asking better questions. So I get these high school students to start thinking in a nonlinear way as one of the subjects I'd introduce to school in regards to, we're always thinking linear, right? Like See, you mean like step by step. Well, I'll give you an example. We're taught the two biggest obstacles in most people's lives is time and money, right? You could do a lot more things on your bucket list if you had more time and more money. Here's the thing. We all have 24 hours in a day. We don't have money problems in life. We have thinking problems. But school doesn't teach you that. See, we're taught there's a lack and there's a scarcity of money in the world. There's an abundance of money. There's an abundance of money. Okay? There's an abundance. But it's a different mindset. Right? If, if I take affluent kids and sit down with them, the affluent kids are schooled differently than the kids in poor middle class levels. They're schooled differently. It's a different conversation around the dinner table. Okay? So the thing is to understand is, see, I never learned this stuff growing up. Right? I learned a lot of fluff, I learned a lot of stuff in school, but I was never taught life skills to move forward into life from me. I had to figure that out through self-education, going to workshops, seminars, and making tons of mistakes. I was taught in school that failure is wrong. Failure is just feedback in the entrepreneurship world. Failure is feedback. You've got to make mistakes. If you want to become more successful this year, then double your rate of failure. Right? You see, in school, we're taught if you and I start talking in class, that's called cheating. In business, it's called collaboration. Yeah. It's a different mindset, right? So one of the things I would teach is not only your thing. I would teach kids, you know, if you want, you know, how do I get paid to go to Australia versus save up money and then take time off from a job or a career to go, right? How do I get paid to do the things I love to do? Your hobbies, your passions, your purpose, your interests. I would teach kids while they're in college, university, how to have a business. So whether you're bartending, whether you're a disc jockey, whether you're helping somebody study for an exam, you're sewing somebody's clothes because they blow a button on their, on, their, on their clothes, how to drive somebody around, they don't have transportation, how to, how to have a guy teach how to meet women and go on a date or vice versa. There's all kinds of things that you can teach kids in schools how to create a business, right? I love seeing kids learn business. So, so one of the subjects is entrepreneurship, nonlinear thinking. Right? So I'd ask, I'd ask the students to write down what are some things that they'd love to do by the time they're 20 years of age. Then I'd ask them as an ex exercise to say, great, what stops you from doing those things right now? Write it down. What's the objections? Okay. And always it's time and money is the top two things on the list. So great. So we don't have money problems in life, we have thinking problems. There's no lack of money in the world. If you want to make a lot more money in the world, go out and solve problems. Build Melinda Gates from the foundation, Bill Melinda Gates Foundation. You know, they've got a big 15-year plan right now until 2030 to eradicate poverty in Africa, to eradicate four more diseases on the planet, 
They're going to invest billions of dollars, but their return on investment is going to be lots of money to the foundation, lots of exposure, and an incredible legacy. Right. Right? So the thing is, money will always chase a good opportunity. I've met kids who are 10 years old who are already millionaires mm. from their ideas and their inventions. Right? I created a program called 101 Ways Your Kids Can Make Money. And I interviewed kids who've done that. Right? So I've got the evidence of meeting kids around the world. Now, they'll say, wait a minute, kids make money doing that? Sure. Now, I'm not motivated by money. Money is just a means of a currency of impact. If you make lots of money, you have more impact in the world. Through a church, through schools, through building hospitals. Money is neutral. Money can be evil. It can build bombs. It can destroy people. And money can also be as a tool to make a difference in the world and make a lot of good happen. Yes. Right? So teach kids about money. Teach them about nonlinear thinking. Teach them about finances. Teach them about credit. How do you get a credit card? How do you build your credit score? You see, in school, what matters is your report card. Yeah. When you leave school, what matters is your financial statement. Right. I never learned what a financial statement was. I didn't know what ROI was. I didn't know what a balance sheet was. I didn't know what P&L, profit and loss, meant when I left school. I didn't have a clue. I wasn't an accountant. I wasn't a bookkeeper. I wasn't one of those smart kids that learned that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right? I didn't know what a financial statement was or a net worth, personal net worth statement is. I didn't know that kind of stuff. I didn't know how you can get equity and stocks and bonds and investments to build a portfolio and how you can create multiple streams of income, multiple sources of income. I didn't know any of that kind of stuff. I thought you go to school and you get one income. Right? You put all your eggs in one basket. The most inefficient way to earn money is trading time for money. It's the most inefficient way. You talk to anybody who's achieved a mass amount of success in business, they'll tell you it's the most inefficient way to trade time for money. But you see, the thing is we're taught through smart, educated, academic people that you got to trade time for money. It's the worst thing you ever do. You'll never get ahead financially. You'll live paycheck to paycheck, which is called job just over broke. Right. And I was one of them. <laughs> My dad always used to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And so the thing is, in school today, we're going to teach subjects like not only thinking, teach them about you know, credit scores. We're going to teach them about the difference between men and women. You know what? As much as we're similar, we're different. You know, Dr. John Gray wrote a book years ago called Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. He was writing a lot of those principles and points. I've met John a number of times in person. Right? So teaching the difference between men and women. Teaching people that when they go off into the business world or the working world, cultural differences. We live in a globalization world today where if you look at any job or any career, there's people from different countries coming in. There's immigrants. There's foreign workers. Some people are on internet business today where you have people from multiple different countries, different time zones, different cultural beliefs, different religious beliefs. But we're not taught that in school. We're taught stuff that you can Google and get the information for. Yeah. We're not taught stuff that's current. So I would educate youth today. I would also bring in a billionaire. I'd also bring in somebody who's made tons of mistakes and, and overcome those adversities and challenges. You've got to teach kids today how to deal with uncertainty. We have uncertainty in a global world today. Right? And certainty in terms of if you have a relationship and, the, and your wife or girlfriend's going to have a baby, to your job, to your retirement. There's so many factors of uncertainty. Mental toughness, mindset training, dream building, setting goals and how to achieve them and hit targets or deadlines. Right? So all these things that are never taught in school that are life skills that we just brush off, but later on in life we pay for it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if you don't learn those things in school, then a lot of times you're outside of school taking seminars, which cost thousands and Absolutely. thousands of dollars. Yeah. And sometimes you don't learn it, I think, as well, because it's such a short burst yeah. versus I think if it was included in schools, it could be kind of a regular just maintenance and you're growing into it over the years that you're there and you come out and you're just ready to go take action. Absolutely. So I really like that. Um, I was kind of curious when you were talking about um, that the conversations around a wealthy table mm -hmm. are different than the poor table. Now, I completely agree, but I'm curious what you have learned, if you haven't brought sure. it up yet, what they're telling their kids, you know, and what uh, sure. their middle class isn't learning. So, I'll give you an example. So, I ask audiences all over the world, over 40 countries, this one question all the time. Why do some parents send their children to private educational schools yes. around the world? And I, I just do a survey of the audience. People raise their hand, they give, they give feedback. And the majority of people will say, better education. You know what the number one right answer is? Networking. You see, if you're in school, as I was a kid, I struggled academically in school. I was a C and D student, okay? I tell people I have a PhD today, a public high school diploma, right? But I have a degree in results. The thing is for me was, 
I always knew that if I hustled and I took massive action and I followed up and I had a high desire of a work ethic, that I could hire the best kids in class. So the thing is, parents send their kids today to private education. Yeah, academics is great. Yeah, the environment's great. But the number one reason why is the networking, right? It's not what you know, it's who you know. Wealthy or affluent people, they teach their kids how to build networks of people around the world. That's why one of the first things they do is when they're on a spring break or a Christmas break, they travel. Why? Cultural differences, religious differences, they go meet different people. If you ever study affluent people, and I've been around many affluent friends, I've worked out with 11 billionaires around the world, okay? I've had a chance to speak at tiger21.com. If you check out Tiger21, very affluent, prominent group of business people around the world. Okay. And I've had a chance to be around a lot of very affluent people. I've been on yachts, I've been on private islands. I've had a chance to experience, not reading about it, living it and experience it. And one of the things about affluent people, what they, they're taught, their kids, is they teach them how to network. You around affluent kids, they'll know who drives the, you know, they'll meet the pilots, they'll meet the limo driver, they'll meet the person who works at the gas station, they'll meet the waitress at the restaurant, they'll meet the concierge in the hotel. They're always meeting people. If you look at their mobile phones, they have a massive Rolodex of people. Because they know that if they don't have the answer to solve a problem, they can call somebody right now and make it happen. Right? So it's not what you know, it's who you know, it's who they know that knows you. Here's the key thing what affluent people teach their kids is where you can walk into a dinner party, you can walk into a ch children's, uh, children's fundraising event for a children's hospital, and you walk in, you don't have to introduce yourself. Everybody knows who you are. And that's impact. Right? So when you see, and I've been around some of the most affluent families in the world, some of the most well-known families, I won't mention names, but some of the most well-known names in the world. I've been in, the, I've been in some of these little homes, been in their offices, been out for meals with them, and they, they do things a certain way to create impact in the world, but when they walk in, you see, here's the thing you look at. One of the things I do in schools all the time is I, I always ask for volunteers, and I'll do this sometimes at adult live seminars as well, and what I'll do is I'll say, I need like eight or 10 people to come up. So I bring all these people up and I say, okay, you're gonna be a 10 air, you're a 100 air, you're a 1,000 air, you're a 50,000 air, you're a 100,000 air, you're a quarter million air, you're a half million air, you're a millionaire, you're a decamillionaire, $50 million person, $100 million person, quarter million, half million, and then a billionaire. And I bring all these volunteers, so actually I said, how many in this room, if you had a chance to be at this seminar or workshop or this school, if you had a chance to take out a 10 air for lunch, and what a 10 air is somebody who's net worth 10 bucks, $10. Yeah. How many in this room would take the 10 air out for lunch, buy him or her lunch? No hands go, so why? How many of you take the billionaire out for lunch? And you'd buy him or her lunch. Why? Because it's specialized knowledge. Right? See, the 10 air hangs out with 10 airs. And they can only look at 10 air opportunities or 100 air opportunities. So the key thing is it's all different levels. Right? right? So if a kid with $10 is now a 10 air, show them how to become a 100 air. Then earn 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, quarter million, half million, millionaire. So there's different levels. But the thing is, is that a billionaire or a millionaire multimillionaire, the thing is when they go out a lot of times, they have to buy things. Right. Because things are given to them because of their currency of impact in society. Right? I always teach kids in schools, when you go out in public, always make a request. Because for every question you don't ask, the answer is no. So as an experiment or a field trip, we get the kids to go outside to a 7-Eleven or a convenience store or a restaurant and say, great. I want you to make a request, because for every question you want to ask, the answer is no, but when you make a request, only one of three things are going to happen. They'll either accept your request, they'll decline your request, or they'll counter offer your request. Yes. So we want you to go out there and practice this, and go out and see if they'll accept, decline, or counter offer. And you'd be amazed when people come back. I have sometimes kids, I'd give them a pen, I'd say, great, I'm going to give you a pen, you got 90 minutes to go, out, go on the street, and I want you to see how much you can sell this pen for. And when you sell that pen for a dollar or two dollars, I want you to trade up and keep trading up and keep trading up. And I want to see in 90 minutes who comes back. We're going to give you a prize because what gets rewarded gets repeated. We're going to catch people doing things right. And we're going to see. And I've had some people in 90 minutes come back and they got something worth 30 or 40 dollars. I had one time a kid came back with a leather jacket that a guy gave it to him because he told him what he was doing. The guy's like, hey, I believe in it. Nice. Right? Yeah. But what did it teach that kid in terms of life skills? That's the key thing. That's the juice of what we educate people on. I like that. Yeah, we need to get more of that experience and more of that. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, you mentioned before about Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm -hmm. Now, I think there's sort of like some classic books that kind of get read when you're starting to learn about money. And in my opinion, the ones I know of might be The Richest Man in Babylon, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, 
Think and Grow Rich. Um, wealthy Barber. The Wealthy Barber. Um, maybe some books by Donald Trump. Sure. Um, I'm wondering if you think that those are the books that we should be reading to kids. Yeah. And what age in their schooling can we start to do that where they're, where they're going to pick up on it? Sure. You know, start at a very young age, five, six, seven years of age. Get them absorbed in that environment. You know, I remember years ago, I was uh, with my nephew, one of my nephews. And I was, you know, we're, he was, we were watching television. He was fairly young at the time. And this, uh, it was Madagascar, some Disney movie came on the TV. Right. And my nephew says, Uncle Darren, let's go to the movie. And I said, why? He said, well, it's coming to a theater near you. You see, he just assumed through the television girls it was coming to a theater near him. Right? And so the thing is, kids today learn at a very young age. They're sponges for learning. Right? And so the thing is, you start to absorb people in that environment at a very young age. See, kids watch by modeling, by visually watching somebody. So if they see mom and dad reading 10 pages a day, then parent, the kids will start picking up that. I have a gratitude jar. And I have this plastic jar that I put gratitude notes in. So when I'm traveling, I have airline tickets, somebody says something to me, just different reflections of things I'm most grateful for in my life day, or you can count your blessings. I put these notes in my jar. And on January the 1st of every calendar year, I take a few hours on January the 1st, I take my jar of a few hundred notes throughout the year, I dump it out, and I go through all those notes of what I'm most grateful for in the previous year. Because one of the things I've learned is it's a paper trail, it's documentation, but it shows progress. Because things that you do in January, February, March, your first quarter of that year, by November, December, life gets busy. You're not going to remember those little things you did in the first quarter of the year. Right. But January the following year, when you look back at all this evidence of documentation, you're saying, my gosh, look at all the things I'm most grateful for in my life. All these little things that I did, things that were hard, things that were challenging, things I didn't know if I could do it. And you overcome it, you did it, and you wrote a note to yourself that you're grateful for. And all of a sudden, a year later, you go into reflection on that. It fuels you with energy to have a phenomenal new year. It's a great way to start for your New Year's Day with a gratitude jar. So I think kids should have that. I think when you're driving your vehicle, have educational audio programs. Here's something to understand. The average person today in North America over 19 years of age will spend an average of 500 hours per year driving his or her automobile or taking public transportation in a major city. 500 hours a year. That's equivalent to a college or university semester of education in one year. People say to me, I don't have any time to learn Rosetta Stone, Spanish language. I don't have any time to do that. I'm just so go, go, go all the time. No. You don't have a time management problem. You have an activity problem. You see, people always say to me, oh my gosh, I procrastinate. No, no. Procrastination is an activity. Okay. Right? When you procrastinate, you're actually doing an activity. Whether you're watching TV, you're laying on the couch, whatever it is, you're doing an activity. Right. Right? So the thing is, with your children, is show them by example. So I asked you just uh, briefly um, about the specifics of the books that you think kids should read. And I just want to know, um, do you think that kids should be taught Think and Grow Rich in schools? Do you think they should be taught Babylon, or the Thurgis Men in Babylon? Or are there other ones, or should we not be doing it at all? I want to know like, specifically, do you think that that sure. should go on? Absolutely, for sure. Okay. You know, another great book is called The Unfair Advantage by Robert Kiyosaki. It's a game-changing book. Okay. I think also biographies and autobiographies of successful leaders, men and women in the world today, that have done extraordinary things, whether they're Nobel Peace Prize winners, CEOs, presidents of countries, that should also be taught in schools today. I think TED Talks from TED.com should be shown in classrooms today, and people can watch inspiring TED Talks from around the world. Showing successful interviews. Uh, of videos of people that have been interviewed that should be shown in schools today because it's visual. Kids learn by visual. Bringing in real people or hooking up by satellite or by Skype, of whether it's a billionaire to a president of a company or a country, having access to these people because what happens a lot of kids in school is they'll see these authors or best-selling authors and they put them on a pedestal and they put themselves in a pit and they minimize themselves. They think, oh, well, that person is just so great because they were a Gandhi or they were President Clinton or they're this and that. But they don't see the potential inside themselves. But when they realize, when they have a chance to meet these people face to face and maybe do a question and answer, and they realize the 10,000 hours or more of training to get to that level of success. See, people see my success today, but they don't realize 20,000 hours behind the scenes to right. get here. And they think, oh, you're just an overnight success, right? So it's those situations where kids in schools can meet these authors, but also learn behind the scenes that success is a series of well-managed failures. Okay. So you're suggesting that not only the books, but we kind of incorporate all these other things and... Sure. Yeah. Meet the authors, meet the people who wrote these books. Yeah. And they're accessible. The more successful somebody is, the more accessible 
somebody is. People say, what do you mean by that? Because they delegate responsibility, but they maintain control. They don't work in their business, they work on their business. They hire people to work day-to-day -day operations. Hmm. And that's the difference. That's interesting, yeah. Different management techniques. Mm -hmm. right? Okay, before you were talking um, a little bit about uh, like the the ten air, the hundred air, the millionaire, etc. Right? Do you think that everyone could be a millionaire? Is that possible? Because I think a lot of people, I just imagine, they're like, oh, you know, like only certain people. Like if everyone was like that, like what would, like who would, you know, fill the gas tanks sure. or whatever? Yeah. So what do you think about that? Yes and no. Here's the thing. There's benefits and drawbacks to becoming a millionaire, right? Uh, one is, yeah, it's a lot of fun. You can fly first class, you can get front row concert tickets, you can eat organic food, all types of whole foods. That's all the benefits, right? You can go to fundraising events and dinner parties and get season tickets at a professional sporting event. It's all that kind of stuff. It's all fun stuff. There's also drawbacks. Drawbacks are you have to have certain kinds of insurances in place, life insurances, insurances on your business, insurance on your business partners. You have to have your will in, in, intact. You have to have attorneys, bookkeepers, tax people, financial planners, right. uh, all that kind of stuff. You have to build a dream team of people around you, right? So the thing is, can everybody be a millionaire? Sure. But you see, the thing is, people get elated and excited that they want all the benefits, they want all the fun things to do, but the thing is, can people actually sustain the wealth? You see, we look at statistically people around the world that win lotteries, within a very short period of time, they're broke again, or yeah. worse off. Because the thing is, their blueprint is set for a certain standard that they achieve a certain level of wealth and then they blow it, or a certain level of income and then they blow it. So, it's, it's, see, the thing is, I always, always taught about building money and building wealth. I was always taught that you gotta work really hard. And yeah, you gotta work hard. You work long hours, sometimes 19, 20 hours a day, right? I just grind, go, go, go all the time, right? Hustle. But at the same time, it's working smarter. Bill Gates, I remember, was once interviewed, and they said to Bill Gates, if you lost your wealth today, your billions of dollars today, could you do it all back in? His response to that was, if I had the same team that helped me build it in the first place. Hmm. Because it's your team. So the key thing is, can everybody be a millionaire? I'd say no, and I'd say yes. And the no part is, depends on your environment. Some people are in a situation they don't have those resources, like in Africa, to be around that kind of stuff, whereas in North America, but one of the things that I love to watch is immigrants coming to the United States of America or Canada. Because they come with 20 or 50 bucks or 100 bucks in their pocket, but man, they have a hustle. Right? I have immigrants that work with me on my teams, and they're incredible people. You know why? They're loyal, they're dedicated, they're hardworking people. Because every month they've got to send money back to the Philippines or back to India or back to their respective countries. They don't want to screw it up. Right? They're not an entitlement mindset. Like people in North America, they grew up there in town and stuff. They know that they gotta work, and if something happens and it doesn't work out, not just they suffer, but their immediate family and their respected country suffers. There's a ripple effect, right? And so that's very important today in our business society and also in our life today, is being aware that, you know what? If you're willing to work hard, put in long hours with no guarantee, you can make it successful. You're going to have peaks and valleys. Success is a series of well-managed failures. But it's when you're in those valleys when you learn the most. Right? I've had all kinds of mistakes, all kinds of failures. Right? When I was in my early 20s, I co-signed a over two guys for a business in Kelowna, British Columbia, Canada. I did it all verbally, nothing on paper. Right? I learned now that it's not been written, it's not been said. It cost me thousands of dollars to learn that lesson. Hmm. Right? Judge taught me that. It's not been written, it's not been said. But I, uh, I got in a real financial whirlwind where I went in one day to declare personal bankruptcy. And I went and met this woman, brought in all the paperwork I had, and I thought, okay, fine, I'm just, I'm in my early 20s, I'm gonna go personal bankrupt for, you know, seven to 10 years, it's gonna affect my credit score in Canada, but it's okay, by the time I'm in my 30s, I'll be all right, I'll turn the corner, it'll be a new direction for me in my 30s. And I was with this woman, and she went through all the stuff with me, and she said, it's okay, there's only one drawback here for you not declaring personal bankruptcy today. I said, what's that? And she goes, you have to pay $1,500 for my professional fee to declare personal bankruptcy. I said, I, listen, I got nickels and quarters in my pocket. That's all I got. You know what I mean? I, 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 I can't even pay for parking in the parking meter. And, and, and she says, well, I'm afraid you, you can't declare bankruptcy today. So people always ask me, they go, have you ever been bankrupt? I said, no, I couldn't afford it. Because it's true, I couldn't afford to. That's hilarious. So you did you not end up? Never did. Never did. Never been bankrupt. That's great. Yeah. Been See, upside down a few times financially. Right? Slept in my vehicle, been homeless, been on welfare, lived in a tree house. Right? But I, I stayed in parks a few times, but I've never declared personal bankruptcy. Amazing. 
Okay, um, getting back a little bit to the actual structure of the schools, I'm curious um, if you think that teachers specifically, because how they're trained right now, you know, they, they don't really learn these skills. So I'm just wondering if you think teachers should be doing things a little differently for the kids or what specifically they could be doing differently. Sure, good point. Well, teachers, they go to school, they go to public private school, so they take formal education, and they go off to academic education for four or five or six years or, or advanced degrees, right? And they come out of there and then they share regurgitated information in textbooks. I think a big thing is, is tell stories. Kids learn stories. You know, Mark Victor Hansen, who I know, who co-authored Chicken Soup for the Soul, sold a few hundred million copies of that book, right? So the Guinness Book of World Records for nonfiction books. Success leaves clues. So one of the things that teachers can do is to tell stories to the kids, real life examples. Kids today are, are fascinated by stories. But also understand today in our society, kids have access to information in a matter of seconds through the internet today, right? So kids get very bored in school because they're used to watching a YouTube video that's 10 minutes or less, or a TED talk that's 20 minutes or less. Kids' attention spans are much different. You know, I was just with Bob McGrath just a few weeks ago. And Bob McGrath, for those of you old enough watching this interview, Bob McGrath, if you go onto YouTube today, if you don't know what it is, Bob McGrath for over 40 years was the man on Sesame Street. Oh, wow. Okay. I had a chance to hang out with Bob. Bob's 82 years old, lives in Manhattan, New York City. And I just hung out with Bob. Great, great guy. We've become good friends now. And Bob McGrath told me that Sesame Street's business model now is changing because when the young kids are growing up 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, they have a different attention span than the kids today. So they're having to restructure and remodel Sesame Street to attract the kids that are growing up with their attention span. Hmm. So even Sesame Street is having to rebrand and reinvent themselves. What are they doing differently? Because I think that would be interesting. Interaction. Okay. So if you look at television today, right, you're seeing some sporting events right now where tweeting, tweeting your comments. Give us your feedback, right? right. So people today are not sitting passively watching shows. They've got to engage with the actors or the sports commentators or sports broadcasters. Gotcha. And that's what it is. You know, interact with Miss Piggy. Interact with the different characters on such a big bird, right? Oscar the Grouch. Interact with them. Okay. Yeah, and that's the difference. Great. Okay. Um, what I wanted to ask now was, in school, we're learning so much science, right? We're learning so much math, so much English. And, I mean, personally, I would like to see it go in a direction where there's more personal development skills and it's kind of some of the things we've been talking about. So, in order to kind of have both or maybe not have one and have the other, I'm just curious what you think should be included. Do, do we get rid of some of the sciences and make more room for personal development? Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure, absolutely. Well, if I'm become a scientist or a biologist or a doctor and I, or an engineer and I need to learn that stuff, great, I can apply it. But understand today, all the information is indexed on Google. I can, I can go anywhere to tip my fingertips in seconds to get all the information. Personal development is learning about yourself. You know, they've done studies now that if a kid just spent a few minutes a day in school meditation, the bullying, the anger, the fighting, all that stuff in schools would, would diminish drastically, statistically, right? Because know thyself. We're never taught to know our, about ourselves. I was on a field trip about 10 years ago. I took a bunch of youth, the ages 13 to 18, on a field trip. Okay. And one of the things we did as part of their camp exercise is we give them a, a tent, a bunch of firewood, a bunch of matches, and a bunch of food. And we had to put them out in the wilderness for 48 hours. Actually, it was three days, 72 hours by themselves. No access, no communication, nobody. And they had a journal. And some kids were freaking out. But after three days, that kid was so calm because they spend time in nature. They get to know themselves. You see, people, I was on a plane recently, and this guy was sitting beside me, and I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to Peru. I said, what are you doing there? He said, I'm trying to get, the, get away. I said, what do you mean get away? He goes, oh, I just hate people. Society's going down. He said, I just want to get, I said, I just can't stand people. I said, well, how do you like deal with yourself? He goes, oh my gosh, I'm so hard on myself. And I have a lot of negative self-talk and mind chatter. And, you know, I have a whole community in my head. So really, this is one challenge of what you're doing. Wherever you go, you take yourself with you. Yeah. You see, you can't escape you. You're in this meat suit for the rest of your life, right? And the thing you're going to understand is that, you know, in our life today is we're never taught to know who we are. Most people fear who they are. I, I, one of the things with me in my own life is every morning I invest 15 to 20 minutes a day into a private conversation with myself in my journal. Every morning. It's, 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 it's non-negotiable. 
something I do every morning. I write my goals out twice a day, 730 times a year. I write my top 20 goals for my personal life every morning and every night, non-negotiable, every time. Last year, I wrote about 803 times, 730 times I did it, twice a day over the calendar year, and the rest of the time was because of my mistakes, my failures, my setbacks. Every time I experience an adversity, a challenge, a failure, a setback, a drawback, I go and write down my goals again. Because it gets, it's like restarting the computer, I restart my mindset to focus on where I'm going, not where I just came from, and then beat up on myself and self-sabotage myself. Hmm. That should be taught in school. And then also, when I'm consistently writing down my goals every morning and every night before I go to bed, it helps me focus my mindset on what I do during the waking hours of my day as my daily method of operation, towards my highest part of activities, to get me in the direction of where I'm going so I live an inspired life on purpose. Okay. Right? Because it, it sets the course of my life. It's my compass. It's my GPS. Very, very important. Yeah. So that should be educated in school today. Right? School teachers, they touch on goals, but it's never shown. Vision boards. You know, I, every year I do vision boards. I do a must-meet list of people I want to meet around the world. And people say, oh yeah, vision board's kumbaya. Well, you know what? I manifested a $6 million mansion in 2007 off a of vision board. Didn't own it, but lived in it. I manufactured um, all kinds of trips, people I've met. I can go on and on in terms of results, results, results of things I've done just off of vision boards. It's amazing. But these practical skills, these tools are never taught in public or private schools today. And kids pay the price they're on in life. Right, because we're teaching them industrial age stuff to go to school, get good grades, and go out and look for a safe, secure job. Right, it's, it's a pipe dream today. Yeah, doesn't live, doesn't doesn't. It's not in this world today. We're in a different generation today, a different period of time. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Darren. Thanks for that message. And just want to say to everyone at home, it's been a great, great day here with Darren, and uh, we look forward to seeing what he does in the future. So thank you very much, Darren, for being with us. Thank you.